quality. Is that my bullet thing? I think it's mine. Okay, take it. No, take it. <laughs> we come now to the time of the lighting of the peace candle. It is spring, and new signs of life continue to come up around us. I think it was either Friday or yesterday, it was probably yesterday morning, we awoke in suburban Goshen to three deer in our backyard. Both blessing and curse that that is because those three now know where our garden is. Um, but the signs of life in nature, the good and the bad, are so paralleled in the man-made world, the human-made world. It's easy to see a news item from weeks ago and to see that that has, the activity continues, the war in Ukraine continues, but it has faded from the front pages and in many people their consciousness. The same is true with neighborhood violence, violence within our interpersonal relationships, and so once again we are called to be peacemakers in the name of Christ and I found some words that might help in the form of a prayer life giving God open our hearts to the transforming power of your love that we might forgive and reconcile making peace and learning war no more, that we might be your people, one body in one spirit, to tell your grace to all the world. We pray this in the name of the one who walked among us as brother and as friend. Would you join me in the litany of peace? God of peace, Christ of peace, spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. We come to our time of confession and assurance. For our spoken word of, conf of confession, will you join me in a reading from Voices Together 892? Jesus, Lamb of God, Have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, Have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, Give us peace. Hillary, will you? For our assurance, we will sing together number 685, O Lord, hear my prayer, and we'll sing it twice through.
Elaine, will you come and lead the children's time? boys and girls. This is Sunday and we come to church, but what is special about today? That's right. Today is Mother's Day and it's a day we should celebrate our moms every day, but today's a special day to celebrate our mothers. Is everybody have a mother? Does everybody have a mother? They all think they, you do. Yes, everybody has a mother. You wouldn't be here without your mother. But is everybody a mother? No. No, I'm not a mother. I don't have any children. So not everybody's a mother, but everybody has a mother. Well, I'm going to read you a story today from this book, Love You Forever. Have any of you got this book at home or heard this book? What well, it's one of well, you'll find out. The, it's one of my favorite books, children's books. And I'm going to have to hold the book down to turn the pages because I found out the last time I read a book to you, I missed a page. <laughs> so, okay. A mother held her new baby and rocked, and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The baby grew, and he grew, and he grew, and he grew. He grew until he was two years old, and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator, and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when that two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew, and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old. And he never wanted to come in for dinner, he never wanted to take a bath, and when grandma visited, he always said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. And if he was really asleep, she picked him up, and that, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. He had strange friends. He wore strange clothes. And he listened to strange music. Sometimes his mother felt like she was in the zoo. But at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the edge of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The teenager grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. 
But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. Now here's her car, and she's got a ladder on top. What do you think she's going to do? If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, crawled it across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. His mom is the old lady. Yeah. <laughs> and the old lady was OK, now listen. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. One day, she called up her son and said, You'd better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. When he came to the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and too sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up, and he rocked her back and forth back and forth, back and forth. And he sang this song, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. <clears throat> then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms a very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. That's the end. <laughs> OK, let's have a prayer. And then before you go back to your seats, I want you to take a flower for your mother, OK? So wait till we have our prayer first. Dear Lord, bless these precious children. May they grow in their faith and love for you. Bless their parents and be with them as they guide their children to be followers for you. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, so you can just there take one. Okay. This morning's scripture is Acts 16, verses 16 through 34. And just a point of clarification here, after Jake reads the Spanish translation, we're going to sing, we're going to sing Voices Together 617 before the message. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a female slave who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men, these Jews, are disturbing our city and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us, being Romans, to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing 
and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. And then the jailer and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Let's sing together number 617, When Peace Like a River. Oh, sorry. Let's wait on that and hear the Spanish scripture first. <laughs> sorry. All right. So I will read a truncated version in Spanish. This will be chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. Del libro de Hechos, capítulo 16, este versículos 25 hasta 34. A eso de la medianoche, Pablo y Sila se pusieron a orar y cantar himnos a Dios. Y los otros presos los escuchaban. De repente se produjo un terremoto tan fuerte que la cárcel se estremeció hasta sus cimientos. Al instante se abrieron todas las puertas y a los presos se les, se les soltaron las cadenas. El carcelero desper, despertó y al ver las puertas y la cárcel del par en par, sacó la espada estuvo a punto de matarse porque pensaba que los presos se habían escapado. Pero Pablo le gritó, no te hagas ningún daño, todos estamos aquí. El carcelero pidió luz, entró precipitadamente y se echó temblando a los pies de Pablo y de Silas. Luego los sacó y les preguntó, señores, ¿qué tengo que hacer para ser salvo? Cree en el Señor Jesús, así tú y tu familia serán salvos, le contestaron. Luego les expusieron la palabra de Dios a él y a todos los demás que estaban en su casa. A esas horas de la noche, el carcelero se los llevó y les lavó las heridas. Enseguida fueron bautizados él y toda su familia. El carcelero los llevó a su casa, les sirvió comida y se alegró mucho junto con toda su familia por haber creído en Dios. La palabra del Señor. Gracias a Dios.
It is my privilege and blessing to welcome here with us this morning the Sefu family and our brother Ndunge. Uh, they have been with us before, so you should recognize them. Uh, but we welcome him here today to preach with us. Uh, his wife, Michelin, his son, David, and his daughter, Eviela, uh, come to us from South Africa, though they are a Congolese family. So they have a very rich uh, and delightful background, which hopefully we'll hear more about this morning through uh, the preaching of the word. Uh, but Brother Ndunge has been serving uh, and pastoring, I think, at a Baptist church, actually, in South Africa for the last 14 years, he said, um, because there wasn't any uh, Mennonite churches in the area where they were. So we have that Baptist background together. I love that. Um, he is now studying peace studies at the seminary, um, looking to see what God will do with uh, those studies as he uh, moves on from there. And they attend Prairie Street Mennonite Church, but are um, blessing us with their presence this morning. So, Brother Ndunge, please come forward. We'll pray for you. God, we thank you for the beauty of the global church. We thank you for the deep wisdom, uh, the deep dedication and faith and testimony of our brothers and sisters from across the globe. May that testimony challenge us this morning. May it reach us with our uh, Western ears and our Western hearts, and may we be drawn into something far bigger than our own context, which is your kingdom, which spreads across the globe and is ready to heal the whole cosmos. We thank you for Brother Ndunge. Please speak through him and give our hearts and our ears openness to hear what he has to say. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Jake. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the leadership of Hively Street Mennonite, Pastor Tim, Pastor Jake, all the elders and the people in the staff and the structure for um, trusting us and inviting us to come here this morning. Like uh, Pastor Jake have just mentioned, it's not the first time we, we've been here. My son David has played a few times here with some veteran uh, over here, the music. And uh, we pretty much, while we fellowship at uh, Prairie Street Mennonite, we also regard Hively Street Mennonite as one part of our home church as we are in Elkhart. We very much have people whom we, we have come to know. The Paul over there and the whole family are our next door neighbor. And I'm looking at the back of the church, I see my professor. And, and I was made aware a couple of weeks ago when I, I came here with Leah Lumea that I have also a compatriot, someone who was born actually in the same village where I was born and Road is sitting there. It makes me feel at home coming here. And so I, it's a privilege to be here. I was also told that in the West, uh, the attention span, especially when it comes to preaching and to listening to the sermon, shouldn't go past 15 minutes. <laughs> and that if I go past 15 minutes and then people will start walking out. <laughs> And then I thought those, uh, perhaps those uh, behaviors, I see them, and I'm a big, a big football fan. And when we were, not American football, what we call soccer. And so in the football arena, when your team is not doing well, and especially they're losing, then you'll start seeing the, the, the fans walking out. And uh, I think that's, uh, that is maybe a behavior we need to discourage in the church of God. And so if my preaching goes on and on, just uh, say, Lord, fill my cup. I'll fill my cup more. I want to hear more of that. But I will try and uh, make sure that I don't upset. I'm a student, and I have a professor here who will need to, to mark me at some point, and I will try to be in, in line with that. I was called to come and share the word this morning. And uh, when I looked at the passage, I said, Lord, this passage speaks volume to myself. And perhaps I still am challenged 
with this passage and how am I going to stand and tell the people that which is still a challenge to me. We have sang a song just a few minutes ago, it is well, it is well with my soul. And perhaps that is a declaration which can be as a, a, a political party when someone says change is coming, change is coming, but inside the heart they feel like mm -mm, maybe we're not yet ready for change. When we're saying it is well, it is well with my soul, can we really stand when no one sees us, when everybody is gone and you say deep down it is well with my soul? Or, it is well with my soul when the fridge is full of food. It is well with my soul when the bank balance shows still a couple of dollars. It is well with my soul when the car can start in the morning. It is well with my soul when there is peace in America and that the war can stand outside the borders of America. It is well. But what what we call in South Africa that when the rubber hit the tar, when reality kicks in, are you going to stand and say it is well? The gentleman who wrote this song lived not far from this place. I was told his name is Oracho Spafford. He lived between 1828 and 1888. A successful lawyer in Chicago you know the story. I'm not going to remind this story to Americans. If I was preaching in Africa, perhaps I can tell the whole story. But I want to remind us daughters crossed the Atlantic, but they couldn't make it to the other shore of the Atlantic. They perish. Wife sends a letter back to Chicago, saved alone. And a few times later, he goes to go and be with his wife to mourn their, their daughters. And the captain come and tell him, this is where the accident took place. And he goes and pen the song, when peace like a river attended my way. How ready are we to write such words Cliff Barrow says that good theology will create good hymnology. And good hymnology, together with great good theology, will lead to good doxology. How we praise God, how we worship God, will depend on how much God has shaped us. How much theology, how serious we are, the depth of our knowledge of the things of God. And so when we get to that level of theology, an empty fridge will mean nothing. When we get to, get, when we get to that level of theology, even if the enemies of our country have come right in the middle of our cities, like it's happening now in Ukraine, in the DRC, in Mali and many places, we can still say, it is well with my soul. And that is the story we are seeing this morning with two missionaries who started their day in the little city of Philippi and being followed by a girl who was demon possessed. As she followed them everywhere they went, we were told that at some point Paul got annoyed because this lady has been following them and declaring these are men, these men are servants of the Lord Almighty and they are preaching message of salvation. Now what she was telling was not untrue. This was the truth she was saying about Paul and Silas, Mark and Timothy. They were men of God and they were speaking salvation. But Paul didn't give the disciples, the apostles, didn't want to give attention to this. 
Why? Because they didn't want to associate that which God has sent them there with the testimony coming from the mouth of a demon possessed. We are told that at some point, Paul got annoyed and just cast out the demons. Paul became there. That was not a Mennonite Paul, by the way. That was a Pentecostal Paul Say, get out, demon. Because if it was a Mennonite, he was going to pray for peace. <laughs> Have peace, my sister. The Pentecostal, by the way, I spent four years in a Pentecostal church in South Africa before I joined the Baptist. Paul cast the demons. Now, when it's party on someone's house, it's maybe anger on the other ones. The party on their neighbor's house may be mourning side on the other side of the fence. She is rejoicing now. She is delivered. She is saved. But what's happening? The owners are not happy. We are told that they dragged Paul and Silas. At the beginning of the reading, you are, the writer is saying to us, Luke is saying, we. This means Luke, Mark, Paul, and Silas were four of them there. But when it came to drag the people out, they point to Silas and Paul. Here, listen to the accusation. They're not accusing them of delivering or casting the demon out. They are accusing them of being what? These are Jews who are disturbing the peace of Romans. When I was reading this place, I said, well, this is one of the big cases of social injustice. When one hates you so much, they will find underlining reasons to, convince, to convict you. This morning I want to title my sermon, Shaken, Shaped, and Saved. When everything you believed, when everything was going well, and in the midst of nowhere, someone comes and shakes your faith, shakes everything you've been doing right, God is in the mission of shaping your theology, of shaping the way you see him so he can use that same circumstance for the salvation of the others. I will encourage you to go around the dinner table after church and carry on looking what happened in the text. The pericope is so rich that we can draw so much out of it. But this morning I would like us to draw attention to verse 25, verse 30, and verse 31. The Bible says, about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. About midnight they were praying, singing hymns to God. When everything went wrong, just like Orachos losing everything, when Paul and Silas are put there in jail, and those jails were not like these gentle jails you have here in America where you sit and watch TV and have a gym, and you have a shower inside the jail. No, this is Roman jail. It's dark. There was no electricity at that time. They've been handcuffed. The Bible is saying that they had stocks on their feet. It is dark. Why do we believe it is dark? Because afterward, the jailer came with light. Amen? It was dark in there. In the midst of that moment, they've been beaten up so much. Now, these are Roman soldiers. When they beat you, they take it very seriously. It's not like Canadian police. When the world has been shaken, 
When everything they believed in, their faith even in God at some point, Lord, where are you? Could it be right that after we have done some great thing for you, that you take us through this way? The Bible says, in the middle of the night, they were praying. They were singing hymns. When all goes wrong, brother, sister, pray, sing. When your theology is right, you got to pray and sing. God will shake you sometimes. We'll allow circumstances to come and shake your whole world upside down. But that is a good reason for us to sing. Hymns pray to God. I can imagine Paul on the other side. Sorry, Silas was on one side of the, 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 the cell. It's dark. Now, Nelson Mandela spent 24 years in jail at Robben Island. I could see that if I walked a couple of meters away from my house, over the sea, I see the jail where Nelson Mandela was. Stories goes like in the middle of the night, they will be there and they start talking. It becomes like madness. And that's where the great politics of South Africa started. So Silas in that cell, I can imagine him being there. And then he's reminding himself of good theology. Even now that my world is all shaken, God is starting to shape again that theology in me. And Silas starts singing. He starts singing. Perhaps I would imagine what Silas is singing in that part of the jail where he was. He said, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning. You know the song? New mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto. In the midst of the darkness, someone is singing the faithfulness of God, and he starts singing. And perhaps Paul on the other side, he reminds himself of how far God has taken him. This is Paul the Jew. This is Paul the Pharisee. This is Paul who was attacking the church of Christ. He says, no, 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 no. Not even these chains, not even the darkness can make me forget how far God has taken me. God has taken me while I was persecuting his church. God has taken me in the midst of darkness when I was in, in a white tomb Inside me it was so rotten. God has taken me from the life of sinning, zealous for wrong things. And in the midst of that, he starts perhaps singing. This is me now trying to be imaginative. Sing Paul in that cell after hearing his brother Silas singing. And then he goes, my sin, oh, the bliss of his glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. He continues. While they're singing, they're singing to who? The Bible says they were singing to who? To God. They're praying and singing to God. For them, the audience is God. But perhaps what we not, the Bible is not telling us, but we can imagine from what the Bible is saying that others inside the cell were doing what? They were listening. Paul and Silas praying and singing and others were listening. When things are going wrong, when your life has been shaken, when everything has been turned upside down, when you think I cannot take this anymore, I was shocked to hear someone telling me, I don't want to live in this country anymore. Anymore, It's disgusting. Because the politics of this place is not just good. On radio, you hear recently they're talking about anti-abortion. And I don't want to irritate. I know America has always been divided into the red and the, the blue. 
Is that how America is divided? I don't want to irritate because I, wa I want to come back again here. I want the church to allow me to come once more. But in the midst of that, when your country has become a place where you feel you cannot even live there, what is your attitude? I want to leave us with three things. When your world is turned upside down, when your world is shaken, remember God is in the mission of shaping you. Why you want to shape your faith differently? Because you want someone to be saved through your word of testimony. When it is all dark, midnight, when it is unbearable, when the doctor has told you cancer will not give you six months to live, you're going to die. When your son in the house has become drug addict, when your partner is threatening to leave you, when you get that phone call at night, your son who lives overseas and saying to you, Dad, I cannot take this marriage anymore. I want to leave. Remember, God, remember how far he has taken you. Remember his promises. He has promised that I am the Lord and I heal you. Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. I am the God who heals you. Not even cancer has the power to kill you. He is the one who went and rose Lazarus when all hopes were gone. He says to Lazarus' sister, Didn't I tell you, young lady, that if you believe, you shall see the glory of God? If you believe, when all hopes are gone, remember God. Remember how far he has taken you in your spiritual journey. Remember his promise. He has promised, and the Bible, my Bible, has more than 300 times, it will say, fear not. And Isaiah said it so nicely, 41 verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When it's not working well, remember the promises of God. And perhaps one of my favorite passage is when Jesus Christ is encouraging his disciples, sending them to go and make disciples. He knew he was sending them to a, a place where life will be difficult, where they will be persecuted them. They will be persecuted and he's telling them, know that I am with you. Amen. Amen. That is a verb in the present time. I am right there continually. I, it's not I will be. As we are in this home this morning, Jesus Christ is here. He is here with us whether the ceiling of this house falls over us, whether there is a big machine gun which walks and kills every Jesus Christ is here. He is right here in Ukraine. He is right now in Russia. He is right now with the people in the places where hunger is killing. Jesus Christ is in the midst of the situation you are in. Number two, when your world is turned upside down like it was with Paul and Silas during that time when darkness is all around, Refrain to be like the world is. Refrain to conform to the logic of this world. Now, Paul and Silas could have been there that night and start rioting inside prison and start making all sort of noise. We are Roman citizens. We shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be thrown to jail without judgment. That's the logic. They will make all sort of noise and call the good lawyers. But they didn't conform to that logic. The second logic, while Paul and Silas are there, the Bible is saying that there was a mega seism, a mega earthquake, in such a way that the doors, the hinges, and everything, the foundation, became loose. The logic is, when I'm a prisoner and the doors are open, what do I do? Escape, isn't it? But these two missionaries saw a greater call 
They didn't want to conform to the logic of escape because they knew that escaping is good, but the rescue from God is better. Because when God rescues, he charged us with a mission of salvation. When things are not working well in your life, when your world has been turned upside down, do not conform to what the world will dictate. They counted being in jail as joy, like James is encouraging, and they waited patiently. The jailer came and walked in there with light, and seeing the reality in, fa in, in front of him, he knew, this is it with my life. He knew my whole reality now has been shaken to the core because what is happening if you were in charge of looking after the prisoners and they escape, you are good to die. He comes and asks them, sirs. Now notice the word he's using there. He's calling them sirs. The, the, the root word for that is highly seeing them. He became very humble. What shall I do to be saved? He is now reminding himself, these are the people who were out there. They accused them falsely to be in this place. But I know there was a young lady who was following them and saying these are men of God and they're preaching message of salvation. Paul didn't waste time at that point. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be saved, you and your household. When things are turned ups and down in your life, reach out to others. When things are not going well, it's time for you to remember where God has taken you. It's time for you to refrain to continue acting like the world will do. But it's also time for you to reach out to someone else. And I want to finish with this this morning, brothers and sisters. We are all here individually. Each person has problems. And those moments where our lives has really become dark, how are we reacting? We have a mission, that mission God has given us to go and make disciples. And so many times our approach is to look outward to the things which can satisfy our needs, our emotions. And yet people are dying without Jesus Christ while we are groaning in the midst of midnight of your life, let your faith see the light beyond the pain. Remember, God is here. He was here before you got here. And his plan to preserve your well-being, both physical and spiritual, is still there. Embrace the challenges with gratitude. Refrain to confirm to his, this world, be different. Express your joy in the Lord in time of trials and reach out in words and deed. Educate those around you in Christ for eternity. Perhaps the challenge I would like us to go home with. How many people have you reached out to when times were hard for you? May God bless his word.